Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're closing out our reporting on National Child Abuse Prevention Month by focusing on a wonderful organization that has been meeting the needs of abused, neglected, and at-risk uh, children for almost 65 years with special guest Sarah O'Meara, co-founder and CEO and chairman of Child Help and Yvonne Federson, co-founder, president, and vice chairman of Child Help. And thank you both for joining us. I have to say, I'm starstruck and so <laughs> honored that you would spend time with, with us to really expose, expose the great work you've been doing for so many children. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mark. You've yeah. been in this business a long, long time, so we feel just as starstruck. <laughs> well, that's that's a first for me. So I'm going to set you up. We're going to go to you, Sarah. Um, but just to just to set this up, uh, you founded the organization and, and it's it had antecedents in 1959, which happens to be the year I was born. So a very <laughs> good <year>. goodness. <laughs> and and you've impacted the lives of over 11 million children and counting 11 million, 11 million, 11 million children, and you have uh, treatment uh, uh, operations and intervention operations in California, Virginia, Tennessee, Arizona. I'm, I'm giving it short shrift because there's so much you can say better than I can, Sarah and, and Yvonne. Could you talk a little bit about how you go from the Ozzy and Harriet show <laughs> yes. to saving 11 million plus children? Sarah, you want to take it away? Sure. I, we had no idea we, uh, when we were chosen to go on a goodwill type tour to, to represent America, actually, and entertain our troops. Yvonne and I were selected out of 500 applicants because everyone wanted to go on that particular tour because they had GS-16 rating, which meant they went as a general. And we had done a lot of USO shows, and we certainly didn't travel like that. Uh, <laughs> The interesting part was that Iman and I were the two chosen because we went on different days at different times and they did not know that we knew each other. So that's kind of part of the divine plan in, in our thinking due to the fact of how it all turned out. Um, we, She was R Ricky's uh, girlfriend on the show and I was David's. Now, a lot of people that will be watching this have no idea what Ozzy and Harriet's show was, but it was a family show. It was very popular at that time. It was, it was really one of the dominant programs of that time in American popular culture, wasn't it? It nice definitely family was. Too. Yes, they were a great family to work for. We uh, ended up in Tokyo, Japan as one of the places. We went, went to Korea and Okinawa and other places. But when we hit Japan, we also hit the typhoon season. And it was the coldest winter on that ever had on record, the worst typhoon. Uh, they asked us not to leave our hotel, but being young and and frivolous, really. We um, we were bored in the hotel room, so we snuck out the uh, basement of our hotel, our military hotel, to just walk the streets and get some fresh air and see the devastation that occurred from the typhoon. In so doing, we ran across 11 little children huddled together. Their ages were from 2 to 10 years old, and um, they had no shoes on, no jackets, they were shivering. They were huddled together with each other. And we rushed up to them asking where they belong. The only thing that we understood, because we didn't speak Japanese nor they English, is no mama-san, no papa-san. So we thought these were children are orphaned. And so we snuck them back into our hotel room up through the basement. And I gave them a hot bath, ordered food for them, and then told the colonel who was assigned for our tour uh, traveled with us, that we had these children in our room, whereupon he nearly had a fit. He said, you have to get rid of them immediately. And so we said, no, we're not going to do that. If you would help us by giving us a list of orphanages, we will try to place them. So we did that, and we put the children in a cab, which uh, was a base cab, and the man spoke English and Japanese. He was a Japanese um, uh, driver. So he could interface with the orphanages to find out if they had room for the children. It was always the same. They couldn't take them. And by nightfall, uh, we were desperate and we realized they had to come back to the hotel and spend the night with us because nobody could take them. And whereupon that's what happened. 
And then the following day, the driver met us and uh, we uh, started our search again. And when we came up to a particular orphanage, the children began to cry in unison. We didn't know why it was because they had been turned out of that particular orphanage. And the reason why, why is they wanted to make room for the full-blooded Japanese children because these were half American, half Japanese. So the discrimination was so great that uh, the, the mothers that were impregnated by our servicemen uh, had no place to put them. They just left them on the street. And then they did go into an orphanage and that was it. And then they had turned them out. So it infuriated us to think that there would be any discriminations like that. So it gave us the fortitude to reach the colonel again and told him we had to find a place for these children, that they were ours and we were not going to, to leave them. Whereupon that he did introduce us to the director of Tokyo Gospel Missions, who happened to be half American himself. He had great empathy for the problem. And the long story is we found a woman that would take care of them in a little hut. There was no front door, no window panes on her, but she had a heart of gold. We told her that we would take care of these children if she would take them in. She trusted us. We said we'd be back the next day. We had a show to do that night. We came back the next day. And when we did, there were other children left on our doorstep saying for the mix, for the orphanage of mixed blood. Before we left Japan, uh, Japan, we had over 100 children entrusted in our care. And if we didn't take care of them, they had nobody else because the government said they, our government, uh, the United States, they said not, they're not ours. The Japan said they're not ours. So these children were really known as throwaways and they did not have a home. That started our mission. And we came back to the United States, incorporated, got our friends who then, uh, people on your program may not know these people either, but Connie Stevens and Debbie Reynolds and the um, Bean Crosby twins. And that was a, our group. That was our friends. They got together to put on shows. We raised enough money that eventually through the years, we had four orphanages for the half American child. Now, they uh, were growing up all this time, and then the Vietnam War happened, and Congress asked us to come there to be saluted. Um, we didn't even know Congress knew that we were doing this. We thought that was wonderful. And on the plane, Yvonne said to me, you don't think they're going to ask us going to Vietnam, do you? I said, oh, no, because by then we were married and had our children. And so uh, we thought that our work had really been done. And so we spent the whole plane ride talking about how we would um, write a very nice no. And uh, when we went into Congress, there sat the, the uh, Commandant of the Marine Corps, and he uh, began talking to us after our award, uh, how pitiful it was for the half American children in Vietnam, and that he would help us if we would uh, consider uh doing exactly what we did in Japan. So Yvonne and I didn't even look at each other and we said, we'd love to. We got back on the plane and said, what in the world have we done? But then we went back and, 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 and got help and ended up building five orphanages, a hospital and a school in Vietnam. We thought that was going great because General Walt was the one that worked with us and they gave us a lot of support from the military. But what happened is General Walt told us you, we're going to have to pull out of Vietnam and we're going to um, have to leave. Do not send any more money over. We couldn't sleep at night thinking about that. We called Congress the next morning and we said, listen, you got us into this and we're not going to leave those children there. You have to help us. And that we they did. And getting airplanes, we got the children out. And that was the Operation Baby Lift. And the baby lift brought over thousands of children that were adopted when they came to our, sh our shore. Now, we really thought by then that our mission had been completed, but we were giving a keynote speaker where a keynote address where uh, the Reagans were uh, on the dais with us. And as we finished our speech and came back, Nancy Reagan stuck out her arms to stop us and say, you two are just the two to do it. And we said, do what? And she said, we want you to tackle child abuse. It's the best kept secret in America. No one believes it. And the laws protect the perpetrator. So we said, oh, we've never heard of that. We don't see anything in the paper about that. We'd have to do a feasibility study to do anything like that. 
And so Ronnie turned around and said, I think we know where we can get that, don't you? And the next day, he had a check on our doorstep uh, himself that the Reagans wrote the first check for us to do a feasibility study. And the rest is history about how child health started, because we we've realized that nobody really wanted to bring it up because the laws did protect the perpetrator and that we'd have to begin by changing laws, which we did. And then we had to create programs that could be on a national television uh, network so that people could know what to do about it as a solution. So that was the beginning of child help. You've, you've touched on Go I'd ahead. Like mention the fact that we also started volunteers uh, mm -hmm. chapters because we are the founders, of course, but we've done it with a lot of help. And that's our volunteers, I think, are the best of any organization anywhere. They've been right by our side and they do events all the time. They do all the special things for our children. We're so proud of each and every one of them. And we really thank them and thank all the stars that have helped us throughout the years. I mean, we have fabulous people behind us and help us. And we just love them all and appreciate all the help that other people have also given us. Yes, thank and you. Kathy Lee Gifford, you know, uh, as uh, head of our uh, prevention program, Speak Up, Be Safe in our schools. And she has championed that. And we have to tell you that she has been with us uh, over 40 years, as have uh, yeah, Cheryl Ladd and a lot of people. So we like to give them a yeah. shout out because they do that out of the oh, goodness of their heart. We don't pay them anything. In fact, Jen, Jen Lilly is also one of our ambassadors, and she's adopted two of our children. And they're so happy, and they're doing so well. You know, the thing that strikes me is that each person can provide some support as a volunteer. If right. you're prominent, then you can use your name to attract more attention. If you have wealth, you can write a check. These kinds of contributions together form a network. It's like different pieces right. in a puzzle to create this beautiful, um, this beautiful complete uh, picture. But it isn't about um, you. It isn't about the Reagans. It isn't about Kathleen Gifford. It isn't about the volunteer. It's about the children, right? So everybody's right. coming together around one, one person, one person times 11 million with with time it becomes it becomes 11 million exactly. one of the things that really strikes me listening to your story is that you touch on a lot of themes you touch on rejection society's rejection mm -hmm. kids you touch on racism which exists in every country and amongst all of us all of us we're all god's children you you also taught, touch upon the gender sensibilities of, of male generals uh, basically uh, telling you that you can't do things. And then you as young women, even until today, as as older women saying, oh, oh, yes, we can we can do that. And then pulling it together, right, pulling it all together. Uh, you touch on the the issue of making the impossible possible. Just in order to take care of each other. That's something we should really think about every day, isn't it? Yes. That's what life is about. You cannot be happy unless you do something for someone else. It's exactly. impossible. There's so. always something they can do, yes. whatever age you are. Service for others is, is almost like the key to life because that's what is expected of us and what God wants us to do. So, you know, one, oh, uh, go ahead, I was just going to mention we have a, a young lady. She was nine years old when she came with us, and she is one of our ambassadors now. And she sings, and she goes to the schools, and she does a show for the children. And then she tells them about our hotline, and she talks to them. And because of her age, she's now 16. But it's wonderful what she's doing. In fact, she has reached thousands of children, 25,000 students she has. In three months. In three months. Wow. And She's doing a wonderful job. We're so proud of her. So it doesn't matter the age. You can always find something that you can do. But she's meant so much to the young children and giving them the hotline. And, and she encourages them that to speak up and be safe and call the hotline if it's necessary or for, for them or for anyone that they know 
that's being abused. She's doing talk, a fabulous job. Can we talk a little bit about the the um, the questions of faith, uh, values? There, it seems that sometimes this country we're dividing ourselves along issues of religion or race or gender or orientation or all these different things. When really, you know, when you when it comes to children and serving children, does it really matter whether it comes from that 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 heartfelt service comes from a Christian or a Muslim or some other uh, religious tradition? Does it really matter? Whether it's it's a secular organization or or a a religious organization, how how do you feel about this this idea of of service in ways that don't divide us as opposed in ways that do? Well, I think it only brings us all together more. It should because I think everyone in every culture, every religion cares about their children. If they don't, they don't know an answer to life. They really don't know God because that's but, what. Every but you care about other people's children. That's, I guess, that's oh, the key, isn't it? Oh, God's children. Yes. Oh, absolutely. We care. We care a lot about the children that have nobody to care for them. That's that's why they are in the situation they're in. Um, it's 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 very interesting to see what it does for your soul growth to help these children. In fact, um, Yvonne, relating to the volunteers. We've given them an opportunity, really, to give back, and therefore it enhances their soul because they're thinking about some uh, some other person's children that don't have what their own children have. And so sometimes they say it's changed their life for yeah. the better. Yes, uh, it's their mission too. We, we started it, but it's it's become the volunteers' yeah. mission as well. We have people that have been with us for fifty years. Mm-hmm. So those who serve shall be served, right? Exactly. Exactly. In terms of, of the hidden uh, scourge of child abuse and neglect, hidden because people don't talk about it, they feel awkward about it, and because it is so difficult sometimes to go through that process of, of resolving it. A lot of abuse comes from families and from friends, um, people who are within the circle of that child. Uh, talk a little bit about how you see the issues of abuse and neglect in this in this country and how we can systemically not only investigate the abuse once it happens, but also prevent abuse from happening in the first place. What do you think the sources of abuse are? Because nobody wants to grow up to be a child abuser. Well, for one thing, uh, they don't want to, they don't grow up wanting to be. However, if you are abused, the chances are, and you have not received help like you should, the chances are you're going to grow up and abuse your own children. That is a fact because that's what they know. And that's all they know on how to treat a child. So but, their minds, they're thinking they're doing the right thing. They're, they're modeling behavior that they experienced and I'm okay. Exactly. That happens sometimes, but, you're asking what really, uh, what is the motivation or why does that happen? I think in today's world, we are accepting so many things that are, are not of high morals. And uh, that when we see so much abuse due to drugs and alcohol, and we see the, the also because of the violence that's on television and the copycats uh, on that. Uh, we have noticed that the the extent of the abuse and the horrible things that happen to children are worse now than we have ever, ever seen. And um, I think that it's, it's yes, it's such violence mm-hmm. on, on our television programs. Children mm-hmm. grow up to accept they are desensitized mm-hmm. about things that really are correct that you were brought up. I was brought up. Uh, to to know and to believe in, they're not taught those things, nor do they think they're important. But moreover, uh, they're not corrected when things happen, and therefore, your the the uh, government letting the children, uh, I mean the adults that don't belong on the streets, out to just 
murder other people, they know there are no consequences. And so uh, I, I think, frankly, that's why child abuse is galloping right now due to that fact. Uh, and then you have different um, uh, modalities uh, in different states that uh, are one of our greatest heartaches right now. And what we're going through, Mark, is in California. California uh, has made new laws that they want to get rid of um, residential treatment facilities. Well, every child that we've had, we have a, a one in California that's been open 45 years. Every child we've had going through that program from the get-go are failed foster placements or group homes. So they try them first. We've had children that have been in 30 different foster homes before we receive them. Now, in California, because of the new laws to get rid of that, their thinking is, oh, well, a foster home is better. Of course it is if it works. But these children are so mentally disabled after their abuse. They need therapy structure. They need more than a, an average family of any kind can give them. And so there it's a rejection upon rejection upon rejection because they don't make it in different foster homes. There have been over uh, 60 closures of, of residential care in one year in California. And so we've done where quite are these a, bit of, a bit of work for organizations that provide housing solutions for young people. And, and if you look at, as you say, as you look at the number of, of youth that are consumers of those services, they are preponderantly uh, kids who have aged out of foster care um, and who have had that type of experience. And we're not against foster homes or group homes because we, we have them. <laughs> we have networks of them. Well, what you're saying is that there, there are a number of different approaches and exactly. try to be prescriptive about what approach you, you may not use uh, might not uh, might have un unintended consequences, right? Absolutely, absolutely. You know that's that's the thing. We're all trying to come from a good place, but sometimes we don't pay attention to the data, and because we don't pay attention to the data, we 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 reach conclusions based in I don't know personal beliefs, uh, what we were taught in the past, uh, maybe our political um, uh, uh, affiliations. How do you actually manage data? to inform the work that you undertake and where you invest your scarce resources. You collect information on what works? We do, and then we try things uh, ourselves for maybe for the first time that it's ever been tried. And- uh, So you experiment. We experiment, but often they work and then become the modality that everyone uses like, our advocacy center, we were the first ones in the entire United States that had everything under one roof. We had the hospital for the examinations. We had the police that bring them in. We have the, the hospital uh, unit that that uh, deals with the children. We have therapists there. So uh, when we tried to do that for the very first time ever uh, in Arizona, <laughs> Uh, I will tell you uh, that uh, people said it wouldn't work. They hesitated to work together. They didn't want to come together. So what we had to do was pay for them to come. In other words, we paid the lease. We paid the money. We paid for everything if they would come. Well, of course, the government liked that because it took that, that off their payroll. And then once they did that, they all looked at each other and said, my Gosh, this works. But what they used to do is to have maybe cases that would last weeks and weeks and weeks. And in four hours, we get everything done. It's all, you know, from one place to the other, and they all work together. And now that's all they do is that for advocacy centers. That's probably, yeah, the best practice. So, what, yeah. was, what year was that when you first did, the, did those experiments, Yvonne? That, when was that? That was in nineteen twenty five years ago, something like 1998. that. Nineteen ninety eight. Nineteen ninety eight. You know, it's very interesting because we work with all sorts of different uh, organizations in all sorts of different states, 
And you can actually see the intelligence disseminating, in other words, circling out from um, where it emanates and sort of infecting others with these ideas. And then they make the ideas their, their own and then they adjust just their organizations accordingly. Yes. So in terms of, of where you wish the organization to evolve toward, are you going to remain solely focused on um, abuse and neglect and those kinds of, of issues? Or how do you see your mission evolving? Because you started off with orphaned kids in Japan. You then go to Vietnam. Now you're dealing with abuse and neglect. I have your website up here, which uh, is, is quite impressive. Um, where do you see this, this organization heading over the next years? Well, our culmination, let us say our swan song that we would like, we have plans to build a global city, and that would take care of children from birth to emancipation. And we would um, have different neighborhoods of foster care, group homes, a village, a residential treatment facility, which is like, program. like intensive care at the hospital, really. And then we would uh, and we would have on ground schools, which we do now. And uh, then when they age out, uh, we have already uh, developed a friendship uh, and partnership with a, a university, Grand Canyon University, where they are going to make it a mandatory um, that they that each one of their students will go through the different areas that they're in, whether they're a therapist or in maintenance or or um, uh, hospitality, because we're having a hotel on the on the premises. Everything will be like a city in its own for one reason, for best practices, so that people can come and study and find out what works and what doesn't work and new innovative ideas. And we would have a, have it as a smart city where uh, we would have hypothetic foods and, and they would learn the students, the people, the children there would learn all the uh, latest technology and things of that nature. So we have some really uh, big partners that uh, are interested in, in this with us. And um, we, we have had many countries come to visit our advocacy centers and villages and the way in which we do certain things. Our hotline, we helped England in developing their first hotline. And uh, so- and Japan is coming to run now. Oh yes, where we began now are- there's a venture yeah, they're developing our prevention program in their schools for the first time. This so it's where? full circle. This is where? In Japan, in, in Japan. Tokyo. Yeah. It's so very interesting. Japan again. <laughs> so is this is this this model community that you're that you're putting together? Is this a physical does this have a physical location right now? Yes, it will be in uh, Arizona, in Phoenix, Arizona. We've identified the land. So basically what you're doing is you're creating a model. We, we've have a, in this country, we have a history, the Hershey experiment, right? The, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, there's an organization, Crown Art, um, around, uh, Detroit, where we, Levittown, right? We, we created these model communities and tried to create these ideas of how citizens interact with each other. You're basically taking that tradition. And you're you're giving it a child focus, and basically uh, trying to create a way in which um, the the young people themselves become more empowered. Is that is that your idea? Exactly, and you well, know we so. we have an uh, animal program, equine therapy in our villages and so forth, and we find that uh, children as you you know, and most of your audience would know, they identify with animals better than they do therapists sometimes. We've mm -hmm. had situations where children uh, saw their sister murdered in front of their eyes and they became mute. And this little boy was in uh, foster homes, 25 of them before we got them because the foster parents would say he has vocal uh of course, he can talk, but we can't get him to talk, so we want another child. So our speech therapist said, oh, we'll be able to help this child. Well, she couldn't. And then the art, the equine therapist said, let me try something. And they told this little boy, they said, Johnny, let me tell you something. 
we're giving you chocolate. That was one of our ponies. And if you don't take care of chocolate, nobody will. So you're going to have to come down every day and feed chocolate and curry and so forth. Well, he lit up so great. He got he ran down to the barn early every morning. We happened to have been there at the time that he was coming to the barn. He put his arms around the pony and he said, I love you. And it broke his silence. And from then on, he spoke. So we always tease the therapists that the animals can do more than they can. <laughs> so um, we we try to deal with the children in any way. We have wilderness programs. We have art therapy. We have uh, all kinds of different sports activities to see where children can excel, because if they can excel even in one thing, it builds their self-esteem. And that's really the the answer to unlock it, a child within to find out something. There was a little girl that we had that uh, uh, she was half American, half Japanese. It so happened she was in our village in California and she made the little gummy birds. And she won a prize with it. And we hung it in the administration building. She changed completely. She was failing in three grades. She skipped those three grades because everybody paid attention to her about the winning of that. So you have to to find the key to each individual child as to what will unlock them. Because they have a purpose in this life. God brings us in with a purpose. If they can identify with that, something that they really enjoy, that's the key to help them develop into a a good adult. And, you know, our volunteers, again, help because they are special friends to the Mm -hmm. children. And many times they take them out and they get to go places that they'll never be otherwise. And these our volunteers are so good to show them the love. And, and that they really care about them and, and makes the child feel so good. And then they share with them, you know, their birthdays. They always give them a birthday party and, and the holidays. They treat them special. We do something special for the children and they take them out. It, it, they're just fabulous to help their children self-esteem, help them to become the person that God wanted them to be. One of the things that I will take away from this conversation is that any time I become self-satisfied that I have the answer, knowing that there's an individual answer for an individual child, and it might be different than my answer, but being able to connect with their answer and, and meet their need is so informative to us, informative to our lives. You've been so creative, and even in expressing what you have done and the magic that that you and your people work. And I know you have a huge, huge team. So let's, as we close, could you talk a little bit about how you build this team and how you put these people together, these (laughs) ingredients to, to, um, to a solution um, and, and sort of this energy that, that you exude and, and allow others to, to be part of that whole, uh, complex. How do you how do you get people together? Well, I think that the your leadership at the top really creates the culture that you want the others to follow. And so, what we try to do is not only find someone that has a skill, but moreover has a positive attitude that um, have the the inward qualities you want. And frankly, spirituality, we look for that. If people have uh, a love of God and want to follow the right pathway, then everything else kind of follows. And so, yes, you want to make sure that their skill set is equal to the job, and we do that. But uh, a lot of things that are much more important almost than that is attitude, is the positivity. You can have someone that's negative and have be the smartest people in the world and even successful at times. But but it creates, as you talk about the energy that that is a down energy. You you know positive energy. We see so much terror, uh disappointment in the way people treat their children. And we need people around those children 
that truly care about them and love them and that can be an example to them. So that's how we try to select the people. Do we make mistakes? Of course we do. And uh, there are times that we have, you know, misjudged, but that's what we strive to do. So you're talking about the combination of, um, uh, of competence, values, positivity, right. and commitment, right? That's and that can be expressed... That can be expressed in a lot of different ways, right? A lot of different people have a lot of different uh, uh, styles, but positivity can be recognized, competence can be recognized, attitude can be recognized. That's basically what you're saying. Let's, let's look at each other and and have a feeling for each other. And yes, right, we'll make mistakes, right, uh, periodically. And learn to love each other and understand each other, not always fight. Fighting, you know, we're dividing too much now. We have to be together and work together. And listening to other points of view. Do you have? Do you sometimes have disagreements, right. and you have to be tolerant of, of of the fact that you're not necessarily going to convince uh, this uh, your your counterpart, um, uh, Sarah or Yvonne? Do you do you sometimes <laughs> look at each other and and just, you're, you're not going to convince each like, other? So we don't argue. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're very fortunate. In fact, we've had people say the most, the, the real miracle is that we've been friends for so long. And that we now have ended up, you know, our husbands have passed away and we now live together. And uh, it's very convenient because we can continue our work and not miss a beat <laughs> since we live together. But it's because, as Yvonne said, we do think alike. So it's not that we combat each other. Mm -hmm. And if somebody, one of us has an idea, you know, we'll pursue it and see uh, if that works because, you know, we, we care about each other too. And so um, we, we fortunately are uh, quite a bit alike about the things that we want and, and the things that we would like to achieve for the children. Yvonne, would you like to have the last word to take us out? Well, if anyone is listening to this program and if they are being abused or if they know anyone that's being abused, please call our hotline 1-800-4-A-CHILD. It's very important that you get help either for yourself or for your loved ones or neighbors. You can save a life. So please call and see what you can do about the abuse and what you can do to help. We will do our best to get the word out. Thank Mark you. Patterson, co-founder, president, and vice chairperson at Child Help, and Sarah O'Meara, co-founder, CEO, and chairman of Child Help. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. Please thank your people, your board members, your, your uh, volunteers, and your clients who are part of the solution. It's just been an honor, a real honor to, to be instructed by you and to learn from you. Well, thank, thank you. Mom. God bless you. Thank you for having us.